here this evening. It's you know, really great pleasure to talk to you. I'm Paul Jackson from the uh, Oxford Brooks Business Faculty, and I'm the liaison manager for the uh, for the degrees that are being taught in business here at uh, Informatics. So, what I've been invited to talk about is the things that are interesting me in my research and my teaching at the moment, but also the sort of things that if you are a student and you do one of these top-up degrees, you might well come across, because I'm going to talk about some of the e-business issues that I teach back in Oxford and that also form part of some of the top-up programs. So if you do one of those programs, you'll see some of these ideas again in a few months' time or a year or so's time. So I'm particularly interested in the new frontiers of digital business. We all know who Steve Jobs was, and we probably are familiar with this quote from him, we're here to put a dent in the universe, otherwise why else even be here? Hopefully I'm here to put a, a bit of a dent in the universe by being here in informatics. You know, if we think back to previous generations, you know, how did we put a dent in things, or what put a dent in things? You know, certainly steam power or sources of power like electricity put a dent in the universe. The space program, you know, moved humanity on in some way, didn't it? How do we do it these days? I think a lot of us would acknowledge that the dent that we're putting in the world, particularly the world of business, is bound up with technologies like this, the iconic iPhone, and all of the business disruptions bound up with digital technologies like this, particularly technologies linked to the internet. So that's what I want to talk about for the next sort of 55 minutes or so, and then you know, hopefully we'll still have time for some questions and answers. But first, I, I need to mention a few anniversaries, given it's a really important week if you come from England. It would be remiss of me not to say happy birthday to the Queen who is 90 years old today and today yeah and she's been our queen since 1952 okay it's also a really big anniversary you might not be aware of this uh, who's this gentleman William Shakespeare and we are commemorating this Saturday the day I arrived back the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death so lots of big anniversaries this week in England. So, you know, it's, it's great to be able to share these with you and to be here in Singapore. Last year was a big anniversary for Oxford Brooks because our roots go back to 1865. So we were celebrating 150 years since this, the foundation of the Oxford School of Art, which is where it all began for us. Now, we changed over the years, of course. We're no longer just a school of art, but we have a, a school of fine art. In 1934, John Henry Brooks was appointed the principal of the newly named Schools of Technology, Art and Commerce. So as you probably deduced, he was the principal for a good number of years, and it's from John Henry Brooks that we get the name Brooks. And so that's the name we adopted when we became a university back in 1992. If you've never been to England, you can't see it too well on here, but I assure you this is the map of Great Britain. There's London. We're about an hour away from London in Oxford. And up there, about another hour, is Stratford-upon-Avon, which is where William Shakespeare uh, was born and died, of course. So we are kind of right in the heart of things. And this is the John Henry Brooks building, which was opened last year, which is our major new refurbishment. So if you come to Oxford, that's the building to look for and you know, pop in and uh, have a look. So Brooks today looks like this. We've got three campuses. This, um, this is the, the business faculty, although we're moving from there. These are the John Henry Brooks buildings. Just a few quick facts. You know, based at our Oxford campuses, we've got nearly 18,000 students. More than 10% of our students come from outside of the European Union, the EU. 
we as a university have partnerships all over the world. Like informatics, you've got a big global footprint. We've got educational partnerships with 43 different countries, and 15 of those partnerships are in Asia, and of course one of them is with Informatics Academy. And we've been partnering with you on the computing program since 1998, and in that time over a thousand students have graduated on Oxford Brookes top-up degrees. And we hope with the new um, business programs that in the next 18 years we'll have another thousand students you know, graduating with Oxford Brookes business faculty uh, degrees. Okay, so that's some background. Let's get into the substance of the new digital frontiers. One of the, uh, the books that we use quite a bit on the e-business module that's taught here and is taught back in Oxford is the uh, Second Machine Age by Brynjolfsson and, and McAfee. And this sort of sets out quite nicely three key characteristics of what they call the Second Machine Age. And I think we're probably all familiar with this. This exponential growth of ICT power, the digitization of information, and combinatorial innovation. So I think this is important background. I'm just going to say a few things about this. So we're familiar with this, you know, costs coming down and power and speed going up. And this has been going on since the 1960s and we've seen, uh, or have we, a nice steady rise in processing power and the number of um, transistors that we can get on a chip. Well, actually we haven't. This doesn't show up too well, but those of you that are mathematically minded will notice this is a logarithmic scale because the increase in the number of transistors on a chip, if we looked at it just arithmetically, it would go like this for a while and it would just shoot up and be vertical. It would be very boring. And what's the law that we associate with that? Moore's law, thank you. So Moore, it became known as his law, but he said this, set this out in 1965 the number of transistors on integrated circuits will double approximately every 18 months and they halve in price. D little did he know then, 50 years ago, that that law would pretty much hold for the next 50 years. And we've all grown up, I think some of us that are about as old as that, have grown up with that law and we've taken it for granted. And I took it for granted until I, I thought about something that Brim Yolson and McAfee say in their book and I'll get onto that in a moment. So today, I mean, this is something that popped into my email, bo email box a few months ago now, and um, selling a Toshiba flash drive with eight gigabytes of memory. So any, any guess how much they were selling this for? Eight gigabytes of memory. You know, how much is that? You know, I couldn't work it out. I had to do a calculation. I thought, okay, eight gigabytes. I could store 1,600 songs, 10,000 photos, or eight, ten hours of video on that. That's big processing capacity. That would have cost you millions of pounds back in eight, 1965. How much today? Any guesses? Five, five or six dollars, yeah. So in UK pounds, two pounds 99. They might as well give it away. And you kind of think of a benchmark. You know, what do we pay two pounds 99 for these days? Any thoughts? A cup of expensive coffee. I think that's my benchmark. And if you went to Starbucks in the UK and, and bought their frothiest, yuckiest, grossest coffee, it would cost you £3.25, which is more than this. So this is crazy where technology has got to. So, okay. So what they talk about in their book is the, the story of the second half of the chessboard. And this is really worth thinking about. Now, some of you will be familiar with this fable. It probably is, you know, a fable. It's probably apocryphal. But it's the story of the wise man who went to the Maharaja and presented him with a game of chess. And uh, the, the, the Maharaja was amazed by this game and he, he was delighted and he said, what can I do to thank you for bringing this game to me? And the wise man said, well, that's simple. Just give me a, a grain of rice and put it on the first square of the chessboard and put two on the second one and put four on the next. So you see what ha is happening. He's just doubling it. Every square he doubles it. The Maharaja says, let it be done. That's fine. Why wouldn't you agree to that? 
So he's doing this as he goes around the first half of the chessboard, and not much is happening for the first half, possibly like the years 1965 to about 90, to 2000. We notice it, but not much is happening. But the point is you get to a point where that doubling is massive, and then it becomes huge. So let's take a benchmark here. This is 1996. This is the ASCII Red supercomputer, the first supercomputer to score above one teraflop. In other words, a trillion floating point operations per second, which is very, very, very fast. It costs an awful lot of money to build this, um, you know, millions and millions of dollars, and it took up all of that space. Ten years later, um, I mean, a year later, it reached 1.8 um, teraflops. Ten years after that, a new technology arrived on the market that had the same processing power. Anybody know what it was? The Sony PlayStation 3, <laughs> retailing at 500 US dollars. So that doubling suddenly, you know, you're, you're something qualitative has shifted. Other things started to happen around 2006, if you think about it. What else significant happened that I've already talked about? The arrival of the iPhone. Lots of funny things like that started to happen. So it's that sort of date that Brynjolfsson and McAfee see as the start of this second machine age. The other thing about this new age is this digitization moving from analog to bit. So there's lots and lots more data now in text form, video form, sensor form, mapping form, all of this available in digital format. So you can combine it, you can process it, you can do interesting things with it because it's no longer in analog form. So this is where this debate on big data comes from. The, you know, the volume, variety, velocity of data is increasing all the time. So a few years ago, Cisco calculated that by 2016, by the end of this year, in other words, we would have 1.3 zettabytes of data flowing across the internet. How much data is that? I couldn't work it out. I had to go and look at what, is, what a zettabyte was, to be honest. You computer people might know. Right, is it? Okay, you're well ahead of me there. So, okay, that's an awful lot. So I thought, all right, what, what does that mean? So I had to sort of put it in meaningful terms to me. So I found out that that was equivalent of 25 billion DVDs worth of data. Okay, I can, I can kind of imagine that, but I can't. So I thought, well, if I put them one on top of another, how far would that reach? And I calculated it would reach two-thirds of the way to the moon. Now, that is a lot of data, isn't it? So that is the, the digital world that we live in. And we're generating, we're, we're moving all of that data around the planet every year. So it's no wonder that the world's most valuable company now is who? Is a data company. A company that doesn't really make physical things. It just processes data and it churns out data services, which is, we know them as Google, but the holding company is now known as Alphabet. So uh, last year, Alphabet overtook Apple as the most um, valuable company in the world. So it's not a surprise that that's happening, is it? The other part about this second machine age um, the authors talk about is this idea of combinatorial innovation. So innovation and wealth creation comes not so much from just creating entirely new things, but taking existing resources, including technologies, data, and sort of reassembling them and doing new and interesting things with them, but with new concepts and new business models. So a lot of the challenges for business is to say all of this amazing technology is out there, all of this amazing data is out there, and the new opportunities of finding ways of recombining that and putting new business concepts, new value propositions out to the market that people can benefit from. So this is the sort of thing that we need to be learning about, researching, teaching our students about. These are the great new career opportunities for people here at informatics. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Okay, so something interesting is starting to happen now in the world of business. Let's sort of try and understand what it is. Here's something that 
many of you will f have found, you'll have spotted this on Facebook. I got this from Facebook. Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, <coughs> creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. And um, something is happening. This is Tom Goodwin writing this in, in um, TechCrunch. So how can we make sense of this? This is what I, I want to explore with you. So I like to think about this as a world of dark matter, a world of dark digital matter. That we, that we, it's very intangible, all of this data, and indeed all of our sort of knowledge bound up with digital is, is, is intangible as well. But just like dark matter in the universe, we know it exists because it exerts a pull on other matter in the universe. So I like to think of it as the dark matter that we need to understand that's helping to rearrange our world and indeed make a, a, a big dent in the universe. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to explore here. And this is about more than just moving from analog technology to digital technology. Other significant things are happening as part of this. So uh, there's a really interesting article that I, I draw on with my students from NIS Quarterly from Yungin Yu, who is in the United States, originally from Korea. And the point he makes is that we can now easily embed software capabilities into non-digital artifacts. Now this is really starting to put a dent in our world. The fact that we can embed all of this clever technology makes all of the artifacts programmable. We can tell them to do things. It makes them addressable because we can identify them on a computing architecture. We know where they are. They are sensible in that they can sense things and collect data for us. They're communicable in that they can report that data to us. They're also memorizable. They can remember lots of things. And as we've seen with all of that, you know, in storage. They can, they can record lots and lots of things. They're also traceable. You know where digital artifacts have been and when they've been there. They're also associable. This is the really interesting thing, that we can network all of these artifacts together. And it's that sort of networking that creates all of these new combinatorial opportunities. So yes, this is partly about what many of you will have come across, this so-called Internet of Things, where we can put things on the Internet and give them an IP address. And, you know, in other words, embedding digital capabilities into them. So people often talk in this context about digital fridges. Well, you know, that's not interesting in itself. What's interesting is when you connect that to other things, when you've got the sensors in there, and when the fridge is automatically telling your delivery arm, that you're running out of something and it automatically appears at your door without you even realizing that you needed it. Have we got someone to come in? It's okay, please come in. Okay, so this embedding of things and this networking of things is what this um, Internet of Things is all about. So it's, you know, this is a really interesting frontier. So, we can see this in all different spheres now. So this is a building called The Edge. I don't know if anybody here has heard of it. I, I happened to visit it um, last month, actually. It's in Amsterdam. It's supposed to be the most modern building in the world. And it's really nicely designed, but there's some interesting facts about this building. One of them is that it has reputed to contain 28,000 sensors. So they're in, it's a very expensive building, but they're thinking about this building in new ways as a kind of digital building. And this is what the person that designed the building says about it. We think we can be the Uber of buildings. We connect them, we make them more efficient, and in the end, we will actually need fewer buildings. So they're using all of those sensors to generate lots and lots of data about what people do in buildings and their belief is that they can understand how people use buildings and that that's a valuable asset in itself and that we can do new things with that. 
So this is all about that embedding of digital artifacts. And we can think about it in all sorts of areas, not least in building design. But as well as sort of physically fixed things like buildings, the world's getting smarter and it's also getting mobile. So mobile is a key part of this. If we think about today's computers, what, you know, what do most of today's computers look like? Well, we cannot but treat a smartphone, given all of its processing power and the fact that we can run software on it and store lots and lots of data on it as a computer. So this is data going back to 2013. In that year, globally, by platform type, 13% of the computers shipped were tablets. Only 21% of them were conventional PCs and 66% of them were smartphones. So they're interesting because they're powerful and we carry them around with us in our pockets. Also in that year, you know, we see this growth in phones, not all of them smartphones yet. 1.7 billion smartphones were shipped by 2013, but this is a key date because by that point there were 7.1 billion mobile phone subscriptions on earth. In other words, more subscriptions, more phones than there are people. And you know, we know that over time, more and more of those phones are going to be smartphones. So the prediction is by 2025, at least 80% of smartphones, and there'll be more than one phone for everyone on the planet, will be a smartphone. A very high-end computer in everybody's pocket. So that's interesting. There's a sort of a tipping point there that we can think about. So some people hence are talking about this as the arrival of a kind of fourth uh, industrial revolution that new things are starting to happen because of this technology and its application in all sorts of area. Some people think this in particular. So this is a book you might find interesting by Klaus Schwab um, called The Fourth Industrial Revolution, produced by the World Economic Forum. And they've done a lot of research over the years and produced a lot of interesting reports. We tend to hear about them only each year at Davos, but they do an awful lot of other things as well. So why is this a fourth industrial revolution? Why is it different to, to what's been going on, let's say, in the, the past sort of 20 or 30 years? Because, he argues in this book, it will create more upheaval than previous revolutions. Three reasons. One is because of today's change happening faster than previous revolutions. There are more changes that are happening at once and across sectors, not just in limited sectors and then rolling out. And it affects things in a more profound way and it's indeed quickly changing entire systems. So let's you know, think about that. You know, where is the evidence for this? You know, think about a technology like the television. You know, how long did it take before we had a billion people watching television or having watched some form of television? Rough guess? Bell Labs invented it, 28, something like that. About 50 years. Facebook, how long did it take to go to a billion users? Once it started opening it up beyond universities and colleges, you know, it was about six years. But from start to a billion users was eight years. The next big thing that comes along, is it going to be eight years or six years? Well, we know WhatsApp went to a billion users in less than eight years. You know, why is this happening? You know, because the platform is already there in the sense the internet is already there. So, you know, once we've got that as a basis, things start to happen more rapidly. So we've got these new frontiers of connectivity. Things can happen more quickly. WhatsApp um, is now 50% bigger than global SMS text messaging. If you look at this graph, you can't see it too well, I apologize for that, but 30 billion messages are sent every day through WhatsApp. So we are globally connected in a way in which, you know, just wasn't conceivable even a few years ago. So that's changing the way we think about the world. Our expectations as, as individuals and consumers is changing. So a lot of people are talking about this idea of the now economy. We're expecting things immediately. We expect to be able to talk to people straight away, wherever they are in the world. And uh, this is Prime. In some, some cities in the world, Amazon Prime membership gives you the same day delivery. Order in the morning, you'll get it in the evening. 
and that's even without one of their funny drones delivering it, which is probably all hype anyway. So this idea of the now economy is one of the new frontiers of business, but particularly in retail. So all of this is having an effect that's disrupting long-established industries. Um, we can think about it, I've given the Amazon example there, particularly in publishing. You don't have to wait for a book, you can just download it now. You don't have to go to a record shop, you just download the music, you get it now. But it's more profound than that. So we've got this erosion of industry boundaries. It used to be the case that we have publishers and authors, bookshops, and we go to the bookshop to buy the book. You know, nowadays, yes, we still have authors, but we've got new forms of authorship, you know, self-publishing through iBooks. Uh, software companies, device manufacturers, e-retailers, uh, network and telecom providers, and the reader manufacturers, they are all organizations that now have a stake in the publishing industry in the way in which they never did before. So that's just one example, and this is happening in all sorts of different industries. Here's another example. Uh, the automotive industry. So a firm like Ford. Here is a quote from Alan Fisk, the infrastructure uh, head of infrastructure architecture at Ford. If you can't read it, I'll read it out for you. This is what he says. We, Ford, are in the process of making a transition from a manufacturing company to a technology company. The difference between us and Apple is getting to be less and less. So that's interesting. Companies like Toyota, Ford, heavy industry might have thought about them in days gone by. Now thinking of themselves more in terms of Apple to survive, they've got to be more like that. A big shift in mindset. You know, what's going on here? It's not just about self-driving cars. There's something else going on. So there's two issues. I want to take these two issues forward and I want to suggest that these apply to all sorts of different industries. So there we got Ford traditionally and there we've got the creative team at Apple. Why are we going to see more teams like that in companies like Ford? First of all, because of platforms and ecosystems. So what's interesting about today's cars is that they are no longer just physical cars. They are also digital platforms. And you know, I've heard it said that up to sort of 43% of the value of today's cars is in the software that goes into them. It's more valuable than the engines. And so once you create a computing platform, you open that technology up to a whole range of other suppliers and actors. You also open it up to customers themselves to do things with the data and, and add other things onto that. So we can kind of customize our cars in, in different ways and use the data from our cars. So that's the nature of platform technology. So one thing this is bound up with is the idea of generative effects, the idea of generative technology. So this is another key part of this digital economy. If you're not familiar with this, it's mostly associated with a writer on, on the internet called uh, Jonathan Zittrain. And this is what he says. Generative technologies are technology systems that can produce unanticipated change through the contributions of user communities. You put a platform out there, users and different suppliers can get on board, and you've no idea really where it's going to take you. So it, you know, it's sort of self-generating in terms of things that can happen with it. So hence why you know, one of the other key parts of this frontier is the importance of digital ecosystems. I just drew this graphic off the uh, internet, and this is a definition which I quite like. What is an ecosystem here? An interconnected web of owned platforms that collectively deliver the consumer a superior service. So it's not just one organization in control of your experience and you know, the service that you get. It's all sorts of individuals, including users themselves, customizing what they've got and creating sort of new forms of added value. So ecosystems are a key part of these developments. So, you know, platforms and creating platforms and using emerging platforms is all part of the new digital frontiers. We see it particularly with Facebook. Most of us, I'm sure, are Facebook users. You know, we, we're, we're users of Facebook, um, and that was the first side of the um, Facebook platform. But Facebook as a platform is a multi-sided platform, so a lot of them are. You know, eBay, for instance, is. But... Um, Zuckerberg was clever enough to build up to 
you know, close on a billion users before he opened up the second side of his platform, which was opening Facebook to advertisers. And, you know, I understand advertising revenue on um, Facebook doubled last year. So it's, it's becoming a highly profitable business. But then it was opened up to third-party developers. So you can you know, build games and apps through Facebook. So we, we're seeing this in a whole range of areas with cars, with Facebook. We might not think of them as being equivalent, but they are all platforms in the digital economy. And they're all spurring these different ecosystems leading to these generative effects that we can't really predict uh, where they will go. Another part of this, another dynamic in the, this new economy is what, what some people are calling the sharing economy, where we're exploiting platforms that support peer-to-peer -peer interactions. You know, eBay, to an extent, is one of them. Yeah, Facebook, to an extent. But I don't know if you've come across this notion of sharing. You know, what this is underpinned by is a recognition that a lot of our assets are underutilized, and we can make more use of them. So. Um, a number of books have come out recently, Business of Sharing, What's Mine is Yours, uh, showing how individuals and businesses can exploit this new sharing dynamic. So this is a service that we've got you know, in the UK, I think it probably came from California, Just Park, it's causing havoc, in, I'm sure, in some cities. But what it's essentially about is sharing your driveway. You know, if you want to come to Oxford Brooks at Headington, it's not always easy to get a parking spot. But you can go on to Just Park and people will advertise their driveways and you can park in their driveway. If they're not using it for the day, why not make £10 out of it? So you can do this. The regulators might catch up with you. It might not catch up in Singapore. The uh, sustainability people at Oxford Brooks might not like it. The transport planners in Oxford might not like it. But at the moment, I mean, people are using it and I've used it myself to be honest. Um, and there's various services like this. Again, a lot of them seem to come out of California. Lyft share. You know, if you're driving to work, you've possibly got four spare seats in your car. So what you need is a platform to advertise it so that other people could share the lift with you. So why not do that? Make five, ten, fifteen, twenty pounds by sharing your car as you drive to work. So again, there's a number of platforms like this where you're just making use of an underutilized asset, which is basically an empty seat. And it's all part of you know peer-to-peer -peer sharing. So okay, so I said platforms and ecosystems are all part of this, you know, changing business landscape. The other part is is the nature of high-tech businesses. More and more businesses, big and small, are becoming high-technology businesses. This is the new design for Apple's headquarters. Not every business is going to have something like this, but I would argue that even smaller businesses will have the char characteristics in the future of high technology companies. What are those characteristics? I've got a number of them for you. There is a high demand in these businesses for scientific research, particularly people with PhDs. High rates of innovation. They're always creating new knowledge and sometimes new artifacts and new services. They invest heavily in R&D. Indeed, many of these businesses may be nothing else but R&D businesses generating new ideas. Such businesses collaborate closely with other high-tech businesses and in some cases end up being bought out by the bigger organizations. That's often your, uh, you know, your strategy is to be acquired. And they employ many scientists and technology staff. So, and this isn't just about Google and Apple, it's about lots and lots of businesses. So I'll give you an example here, you know, artificial intelligence. Who's familiar with this chap? Dennis Hassabis. If you don't know him, he's going to be as big a name in the next few years as you know, the Google guys and Zuckerberg. I'm going to play you a video. So he's a guy that founded a company called DeepMind. DeepMind is based on the Euston Road in London. It was acquired by Google very smart move. What he does in this business, he has over a hundred people who are PhDs, particularly computer scientists, but also people with PhDs in, in neuro, neuroscience. So what they're trying to do is to build 
um, algorithms based on an understanding of neural networks so that we can create new ways of, uh, of, of sort of machine learning. So this is the new frontier of artificial intelligence. And a lot of his early work has been focused on um, getting games to learn, sorry, get, getting algorithms that can learn video games and play video games better than humans. So you probably saw recently that DeepMind beat Go in Korea. This is slightly earlier. I'll play this for you. Second video is my favourite video actually. This is a game of breakout and there's more gradations here of the agent getting better, the system getting better. So this is after 100 games. So just 100 games. And you can see again here the system is pretty terrible but you can probably convince yourself that maybe it's starting to get the hang of the fact that it should move the bat towards the ball. Um, as of the 300 games, so it's now hitting the ball back uh, pretty consistently and it's almost never missing, so it's about as good as the best humans can be in this game. Um, and then we thought, well, that's pretty cool. What would happen if we just left the, the, the machine playing the game for a couple more hundred games? And this amazing thing happened. What happened was it discovered the optimal strategy was to dig a tunnel around the left-hand side here and then send the ball, you know, with this unbelievable accuracy around the back. So, so that's really cool because um, actually the, the, the brilliant programmers and researchers who are on this program, um, they're brilliant at programming and coming up with algorithms, but they're not so good at playing Atari. So, um, so they didn't actually know that strategy for themselves. So they, this is something that their, their own creation taught them. So, so, you know, we see the new frontiers of machine learning. Okay, that seems a million miles away from business. And yet, it, as I understand it, Google bought DeepMind for about half a billion dollars. So they can see the application of, of these ideas. So it's not just about the data. Sometimes we can think it's all about big data and just sort of crunching big data. It's about the algorithms that you can build. And in DeepMind's case, it's this combination of neural networks and the ability to create computer-based algorithms that is forming this new artificial intelligence frontier that makes DeepMind you know, such a valuable company, will have such an impact on Google. Now, this might seem a strange link. Who's familiar with this bizarre video? Yeah? Now, Johnny Depp and his... I'd never come across his wife. She seems very nice, Amber Heard. It, it is a bizarre video to watch. Now, I don't know if you're a Johnny Depp fan. Is, is, he, is he any good? What do you think, as an actor? He's certainly very wooden in this video. Why, have I, why, not, why am I showing this? I have a very good reason. Now, this is another example. This is a company called Epagogix. They're, again, based in London. But this is what they say about themselves, that they exist to help business leaders make big decisions. I'll read it out for you. Um, deciding which projects to green light, which to walk away from, appropriate levels of budget and remuneration for star performers are issues throughout all industry sectors and particularly so in the event-driven film and television industries. So again, they're creating algorithms, but what they've focused on is an algorithm that will take a film script, and I kid you not, and will tell you how much money that film will make and they have been unerringly accurate, and they are employed by various film studios. And they have been retained because we can presume they are very good. So you can begin to see the link. One of the things that they can tell you is what things will impact on the success of a film and be correlated with how much it will generate at the box office. So this starts to answer the question in a very objective way as to whether film stars are worth their money. And, and I, I go with this, there are three actors in the world that are worth their money. Only three. Question number one, is Johnny Depp one of them? Who thinks, yes, that Johnny Depp makes a big difference? One? Okay, I mentioned him. So you, okay. Johnny Depp is one. That surprises me a bit. Who are the other two, do you think? Yeah, I know. I thought Harrison Ford, but not according to their algorithm. I know people say that. People say he's the most... But Brad Pitt? Third one? D yeah, they're all... I think it's him. 
well, okay. But there is, you say, are they old guys? Now, interestingly, there is one actress who is negatively correlated. So you, you're better off not paying, paying her not to be in your movie. <laughs> but they won't say who it is. I, 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 I would guess. I think I've got a guess. Who would you say it is? Gwyneth Poulter. Interesting. Yeah, no. I'd say it's Angelina Jolie, but they won't say it because she's married to him. Okay, so I mean, going forward, just taking Deep Mind and the, these other ideas, you know, it's not just one bit of technology. I think the Deep Mind example is a good one. It's the integration and management of digitally related knowledge and know-how that's the key. It's the ability to bring these things together. Deep Mind is not a big organisation, but it is, you know, in my view, a big technology, a technology business. Okay, so it sounds very positive, but there are two worlds here, and this is underpinned by the World Economic Forum reports and book. There are those that are exploiting the digital frontier and making money out of it, but on the other hand, there are those threatened by automation. So there was a, a report recently. Um, she's smiling, but for how long? This is why. This is from Oxford University, actually. So they did a study and calculated that 47% of American jobs would be subject to computerization in the next 20 years. And the reason I have that young lady there is because she is top of the list. Sort of a 99.9 .9 percentage possibility of telemarketing being automated. You know, you're going to have to find an amazing niche to stay in that business. So that's where the world of marketing is going. You, you, but there are niches that you can occupy and make money out of. So in many industries, who watches Mad Men? Is that big over here? It's on Netflix, yeah. So it's, it's an American series about an advertising agency in, on Madison Avenue in New York in the 50s and 60s. You know, it's, it's actually very good. Um, but in those days, things didn't change very much. And, it, you know, you needed an advertising agency in order to promote yourself in the newspapers or on the TV. You know, great stuff. And, you know, these people had a job for life. They don't anymore. Things are happening you know, really quite dramatically nowadays. So this is some data on US advertising spend as published in The Economist uh, a year or two back. And what this traces is uh, advertising spend um, on newspapers, magazines, through to the internet. So we see, this is why newspapers are, in many cases, going out of existence or going to digital only, you know, really falling away by 2016. People still watch a lot of TV and cinema, but a lot of it is catch-up. A lot of it is subscription-based without adverts. And a lot of it, because it's catch-up, you can go straight through the adverts. Where is the growth? Not surprisingly, more and more money being spent on internet advertising. Why is that? You know, because that's where the eyeballs are these days. Um, you know, we're spending less and less time um, on looking at traditional media. You know, where is the growth? coming from, um, you know, growth in mobile, more and more time spent on mobile, more and time spent on desktop um, and laptop PCs online. That's where the eyeballs are, so that's where advertising is happening. So what it means is that there's threats and there's opportunities. You know, I know this is a bit of a joke, but this is Gartner's digital marketing transit map. And it, you know, if, if marketing were a city like Singapore, you know, what would the transit map look like? You know, indeed, at the moment, you're building new stations, aren't you, and putting new lines in. Um, and maybe there are parts of the island that are becoming depopulated and you're closing those lines down. Well, that happens in some cities. But what have you got here? You know, you've got lines bound up with analytics, with social search, with you know, sort of rich data technology, uh, viral video, all sorts of things. You know, a whole new universe is emerging with lots of niche specializations. They come together at certain hubs where you need collaboration. But, um, you know, this is an expanding world, and this is just the world of digital marketing, but it is bound up with digital technology. Again, it's that fusion of, of digital skills and technologies with sort of substantive marketing skills. So, you know, the, the future frontiers are about blending these and finding your niche, but recognizing a lot of traditional areas are becoming automated. 
and you know of low value. Another thing I would say as part of this new world is that place matters. You know, we kind of think of the world, everybody's on the internet. In the early days of the World Wide Web, we thought, you know, you can be anywhere and you're going to make money out of this. It's actually not the case. Um, and this is a, an article from The uh, Economist, and they, they, they said it very succinctly, very nicely. The reports of the death of distance have been much exaggerated. Many internet startups head for San Francisco, New York, Berlin, London, or other hubs to be close to like-minded people. So, you know, decisions you make about business, about your career, are also bound up with where you want to do those things. Now, where are the popular hubs for technology professionals? Okay, this is two or three years old. What are the top hubs? USA, UK, Singapore. People head there to be close to like-minded people. But even in the USA, it's not everywhere. It's parts of California, parts of New York. London, it's not everywhere. Sorry, the UK is not everywhere. It's not even London as a whole. You know, there's clusters of business in what we call Silicon Roundabout, the Shoreditch area of South London. So there's lots of businesses growing up there. Again, it's a matter of that networking of expertise and people with financial and startup skills. So where you choose to locate is crucial as part of this new business, uh, this new business world. Another way of looking at this, some other data to back it up, who's rising and who's falling in this new world? So this is something that appeared in the Harvard Business Review, where the digital economy is moving fastest. So this is from uh, Tufts University, their so-called Digital Evolution Index, how countries are building their digital capacity. So what this is showing is the rate of change. Are you receding? Are you slowly advancing? Or are you rapidly advancing? And are you, you know, mature? Are you sort of... Okay, where is Singapore? This is what they say. But then again, you look at some of these countries, you know, countries like the Netherlands that I know well, under austerity, funding has been falling away. You know, it's losing its competitive position. So this is the challenge for Singapore to maintain, to attract people employment practices, immigration practices to attract people, to encourage investment, creating the infrastructure. You know, those are the challenges. How do you maintain that? Okay, so the future. I've got two or sli three slides to finish off. I think there are really exciting opportunities in the world out there, and I think it is that fusion of expertise. Uh, one of them, I would suggest, is the area of systems biology. Um, you can't read the words there, this is just an advert I pulled out, big data to personalised treatment. So mapping us as individuals, understanding us in order to target treatment in a way in which you know, we could never do before because we might have had you know, knowledge of, uh, of, of cancer and knowledge of biology but we weren't able to, to finesse our knowledge of the individual patient down to a very individual level. This is something I spotted in Wired magazine, technology magazine some of you may read, and it's a, a technology, a product called HeartFlow. This is what it said in the article, HeartFlow draws on computational fluid dynamics, a technique in which the flow of liquid is modelled numerically. So what they're doing is modelling, you know, analysing the heart and modelling the flow of blood and oxygen through the heart so that they can make sure that they diagnose heart disease better and tailor treatment accordingly. So it's, again, it's the computational um, skills bound up with biological skills. So, you know, we're interested in business. You know, there is a, a business side to this. You know, how do we make money and, and grow businesses in this new world? It's about combining these technologies and these skills, but it's all about what we can call knowledge-intensive entrepreneurship, yeah, pouring the skills and the knowledge and the technologies in, but with an entrepreneurial zeal where we can spot the new business opportunities and build businesses and services around all of those great opportunities. Thanks very much for listening.